Well, welcome everyone to uh, this or, or to this uh, Medicine Grand Rounds, and this Medicine Grand Rounds is the Fialco Scholar Award presentation. And the Fialco Scholar Award is um, considered to be the the uh, highest honor of the of the Department of Medicine for uh, faculty members at the rank of assistant professor. And this award was established in memory of uh, Philip and Helen Fialco, and it's to uh, in recognition and support of a early career uh, investigator or assistant professor at the rank of assistant professor who shows outstanding promise as a scholar. And uh, at, for background, uh, Dr. Fialco um, was chair of the Department of Medicine for a period of about 10 or 12 years and then became dean of the School of Medicine. And he and, uh, he and his wife, Helen, were very invested in the development of um, early faculty members and fortunately, they uh, passed away tragically uh, on a trek in Nepal from an avalanche. And afterwards, uh, uh, this uh, this award was established. He always had Dr. Pialco and uh, and his wife Helen always had an interest in the in the progress of junior faculty and wanted to um, identify mechanisms to promote their career development and scholarship. And this award is in that in that memory and in that context. Today, also in attendance is Dr. Uh, Michael Fialco, who's, who is the son of uh, Philip and Helen Fialco. And uh, Dr. Michael Fialco is a professor in the, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And this year's recipient is Dr. Rachel Bender Ignacio. Each year, the Department of Medicine solicits nominations for the Fialco Award from the division heads. And uh, we generally get four or five nominations and then that we have a committee that then uh, ranks the individuals and selects the uh, recipient of the award each year. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bender Ignacio is in the division of allergy and infectious diseases. And she's an assistant professor of medicine and director of UW positive uh, research. And she'll explain what that is and also has an adjunct assistant professor appointment in the Department of Epidemiology. She also serves as the medical director of the COVID-19 Clinical Research Center and is also appointed as an assistant professor in VID or the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division at the Fred Hutch. And so I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll call on Rachel to start sharing her screen and um, she'll give her presentation. And if you have questions during the course of her presentations, please put those questions in the chat and uh, Dr. Shiv uh, uh, Bandari will then um, ask those questions at the end of uh, Dr. Bender Ignacio's talk. So I'll stop sharing now and give it and give the podium over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Conrad. Um, it is really my pleasure to be here today, and I'm really um, so thankful for the Department of Medicine. Um, for this honor and for the Fialco family for um, making sure that this pathway is open for um, early career faculty and um, and it, and I really do feel honored to get to present um, today for you all. So the title of my talk will be Innovating Clinical Trials Across the University of Washington and the Fred Hutch. These are my disclosures and a brief roadmap. Um, I want to talk start first about some of the um, problems that we have in conducting clinical research during epidemics and talk a little bit about the founding of the COVID Clinical Research Center and some of the innovations that we had during the pandemic in clinical trials. I'm going to intentionally not talk about the trial results. Um, so um, if you were interested in that, happy to discuss more in the future. I think we've all been inundated with that. So I wanted to share kind of a different perspective and then talk about UW positive research and um, some innovative things that we were doing and hopefully can do together in the future. So um, these are some quotes that I just wanted to start off with. Um, these are some things that I've been thinking about really since um, you know March of 2020 about conducting research during a pandemic or during an epidemic. Both of these are really a reference to um, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa um, in 2014, 2015, but really inspired, I think, how a lot of us proceeded with trying to study um, COVID and then MPOX and, and um, other uh, viruses recently. So 
I know that you are all very familiar with hydroxychloroquine. Um, I just wanted to give what's a little bit of um, sort of my personalized version of the hydroxychloroquine roller coaster. Um, I call it the reflux version because I developed reflux during this time that I had never had before. Um, and um, it really was, I think, just due to the speed with which everything progressed. So as um, many of us know, there was a paper um, uh, that was pr presented as a preprint um, by Gautre and um, Raoult from um, the University of Marseille showing um, that hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin had a beneficial effect in patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19. Um, by just a few days later, there were 16 clinical trials that had already been registered for chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in China. Um, and then by March 25th, this is where I entered the picture, I think maybe even as far as March 22nd, um, working on one of the multi-center randomized trials that came out of the NIH in partnerships with um, uh, with some of our industry um, partnerships. So the trial that I worked on first was called Hat COVID and it was sponsored by Novartis, um, but it came to us through a partnership with the ACTG, um, one of the DADES networks. Um, and so uh, we had that protocol finished by the 4th of April, just a few days after um, we had read this preprint and enrolled our first patient less than um, a month later. So this is really kind of unprecedented timelines. Again, this is a, a multi-center national um, U.S. trial. In the meantime, um, the WHO solidarity trial and the recovery trial in the U.K. showed no benefit. We continued rolling part enrolling participants. The FDA um, withdrew the EUA. And pretty much during this time, I'm talking with Nick Johnson from uh, the, our Department of Emergency Medicine, who was one of the protocol leaders of the um, NHLBI's ORCID trial. And essentially, our phone calls every day went, have you stopped your trial yet? Is it futile yet? Is it still ethical? Do we still need more data? Um, and uh, my colleague in our trial, um, uh, Dick Chason, who has really been one of the leaders of HIV research since the 80s, told me at this point that he says that there was as much change in the literature and standard of care in the 10 years of HIV research that he participated in from 1987 to 1997 as there were in the last eight weeks that we conducted that trial. So our trial was open and shut in eight weeks. Um, Christine Johnston and Rian Barnabas, um, other colleagues in um, my division were working on um, fully remote studies at that time and kept theirs going a little bit longer and added, um, I think, quite beneficially to the literature there as well. So um, at this point, we all know sort of the end of this by August um, and uh, most of the data collection is done and hydroxychloroquine lives on. So when MPOX hit, um, I said it was really uh, deja vu all over again, and I'll talk a little bit about um, a piece that I wrote with some colleagues in JAMA recently. Um, so as of earlier this week, the United States has had 30,000 cases of MPOX that have been documented, and I think we're actually be, uh, ahead of that number since um, we're having another cluster right now in the Pacific Northwest. Um, until they stopped publicly reporting the numbers of treatment courses in January of 2023, the CDC had offered um, 7,500 courses of tecovirumab through um, the emergency IND mechanism and um, ASPR had distributed um, a bunch of the strategic stockpile across the country. Um, however, um, the STOMP study, which is led again out of uh, the Division of AIDS and the ACTG network, and of which I am um, the local pro uh, uh, study head, but um, not part of the protocol team this time, have been trying to desperately enroll in this study. Um, and um, this study also was opened to accrual within eight weeks of writing the protocol um, by colleagues um, Tim Wilkin and others as part of the ACTG. It was revised um, to allow, allow fully remote or in-person participant a few months later. And as of this week, we have 177 people in this trial um, in the U.S. and Mexico and several countries that still have not brought this trial online after one year. Um, meanwhile, while there have been almost 8,000 courses of the emergency IND drug given out by the CDC. So what are some of the logistical challenges to conducting therapeutics research during an epidemic? So obviously there's competing demands with overwhelmed clinical care. We all know this from COVID. I think maybe for those um, who are not involved in the MPOX response, this was less evident, but for our colleagues at um, Seattle King County Public Health and Madison Clinic, there was certainly um, just an inundation with response, um, vaccination, treatment, evaluation. Um, during COVID, it was space for isolation, um, having qualified research staff. So 
Um, normally we bring in clinicians and researchers into all of our research. Um, we needed nurses who could run infusions. Everybody was working in the clinical space um, and then finding people who had experience in research, being able to hire them during furloughs, being able to allocate funding for them in a, in a timely enough way that they could actually come on board to these studies was extremely difficult. And then specifically for epidemic trials, there's a time of urgency to enroll. So we had to enroll people very rapidly within um, positive test or an exposure or symptoms, depending on the study. This was a little bit easier in the inpatient setting where people came to us and they were hospitalized, but in the outpatient setting, um, it was very, very difficult. Um, and then a lot of this was really about the systems not talking to each other. How do people even find out about these studies again, unless they're one of our um, uh, hospitalized patients? And then this really brought up a lot of issues in terms of equity and access to research facilities. So um, what we really found is that people who are in the system are in the system and we can find them um, and reach out to them for research. But um, the speed of the development of these studies really precluded a lot of that engagement that needed to happen with the communities who are not accessed by healthcare or who do not be are not able to access healthcare and are also not able to access research. Um, this obviously impacts diversity of who enters trials, representation of people in trials, trust. Um, we really saw this um, with COVID more than anything else. Um, so I wrote this slide three years ago, um, and it hasn't changed. And that's, I think, the unfortunate thing that I, I want to, you know, keep talking about. This is not over. So again, scientific challenges to conducting the research. We were building these studies while flying at the same time. Um, same again for MPOX with a little bit more clarity this time. Some of the questions were, what are we even measuring? What are the endpoints? What happens when the incidence of the endpoints change? So as people get vaccinated, as people have prior immunity, as we have better care, um, the severe outcomes go down. So what are we measuring now? Um, will the FDA accept virologic endpoints as a biomarker? So one some of the few um, biomarkers or um, surrogate endpoints that the FDA does accept for clinical trials are for viruses. CMV, which was, I think, a big win from the UW and the Hutch um, and, and having the FDA recognize that, Hep C and HIV, but there still is not a, um, a recognized biomarker for change in um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, shedding or other respiratory viral shedding. Um, so also we needed to know what the standard of care was and what was the standard of care going to be tomorrow? And can we randomize people to placebo? And then I think one of the big questions that's still really ongoing is how do we measure symptoms from these in, um, these infections? Um, the flu pro, which is a patient reported outcomes used for influenza, works really well for influenza, but it doesn't really capture all of our COVID symptoms. How do we capture MPOX symptoms? What about the next time? Again, this is a slide I wrote two years ago. It's still true. So excluding the results from these studies, what did we get out of the trials? And I'm more um, interested in what did we learn again about how to conduct clinical trials? And I'm sorry, but this is my favorite meme um, from the pandemic, so I had to bring it back out. So I wanna talk about um, the Rise Above COVID study or ACTIVE2 study, which is um, uh, the big study that I was on the leadership team for and really kind of um, brought out a lot of um, the questions that that I've been trying to answer and, and thinking about how to do things differently in the future. So ACTIVE was a part of the U.S. government COVID response, which used to be called Operation Warp Speed. I think many people are more familiar with the vaccine efforts associated with this, but there was a tremendous inpatient, outpatient, and remote treatment component to this. Um, this was a platform adaptive clinical trial. I'll talk a little bit more about um, the platform um, uh, type of trial. Um, Active 2 looked at a variety of outpatient treatments um, from infusions, injections, pills, and even inhaled um, interferon using a novel USB powered device. Um, over the course of two years, we enrolled 4,000 patients in seven countries at 173 sites. So that was a tremendous win. Um, but other than bamlanivimab, um, which was the first drug in the trial, no results have actually led to um, directly to an EUA. And I kind of liken this um, process in this set of um, platform trials a little bit to an AT-AT from um, Star Wars, where it's a big, slow-moving machine and it works very, very well, but it's easily foiled by get its, getting its legs tangled up and it can be taken down quite quickly. And I feel like that's a little bit of what happened here in terms of um, being able to get data out of these studies and getting the results out to, um, to the people when they were needed as quickly as possible. So why do we conduct platform studies? So these have been around before COVID. They're not new, but I think the implementation of them in a very rapid sense 
um, are really um, uh, what is new. So it's an ability to compare multiple therapies with a common control. So you use few, fewer participants because each group is randomized one to one, but each participant has an ability to achieve X um, to one chances of the product. So in this trial, if there were eight um, products available, each person had an eight to one chance of getting some active product versus a matched placebo to one of them. And in theory, it's supposed to allow continuous introduction of new agents. I say continuous with an asterisk because nothing was rapid in this. Um, this is our ATAT. And um, it was really from a regulatory and operations um, uh, standpoint was really um, a large um, kind of burden to get this gigantic machine to work as quickly as it needed to, despite the fact that from a statistical sense and a design sense, it was very elegant. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about pharmacal equity, which I think is part of the push that I was making as a member of this trial. Um, I was asked to lead um, as a, the scientific part of the partnership with AstraZeneca and the two arms of the monoclonal antibody in this trial. I was the lead for one and the co-lead for the other with um, my colleague David Wool at UNC. And as thinking about this, this word didn't exist yet as we were thinking about it. Um, Dr. Atibe Usien um, coined the term pharmacal equity in 2021, um, but I think it's really been a guiding principle about making sure that everybody has access to high quality medications and that it's not based off of disparities. And so during this whole time, even before I knew this word, we were thinking about how to design studies and products um, that also address the access. As we knew, getting a monoclonal antibody infusion for COVID was very, very difficult. And so we're thinking about how do we how do we change that at the same time as we're testing new drugs. So in my role in this study, I really wanted to look at um, the efficacy of intramuscularly injected monoclonal antibodies, just thinking about the fact that this would be much more easy to give to somebody in a tent, in a line of cars, in a parking lot, as we ended up seeing in some cases um, in, in larger states like Florida. Um, not only does it require, um, you know, less, you know, IV um, infrastructure, having infusion nurses, it's more rapid, it's much easier to administer anywhere. So we were thinking about, um, could somebody be given these treatments in a skilled nursing facility, in a prison, and, you know, again, in a tent, in a parking lot. Um, and one of the things that I had a concern about is that when we inject things into the gluteus muscles, um, there's a really large adipose layer for a lot of people. And there's also disparity in who has adipose layers um, by gender or by BMI. And so really concern about having slow absorption when it gets injected into the gluteal fat than into the muscle. So in thinking about all of this, what I really wanted to do was actually pilot um, giving this monoclonal antibody in the thigh, which for most people has less of an adipose layer, more likely to be able to get through with a um, standard or even a longer size needle um, and has faster and more consistent reabsorption. And monoclonal antibodies had really only been studied given into the thigh um, with bacillus and thresis. Um, and it's not a commonly used drug. It was, it's, I think, sort of a Department of Defense um, uh, level product. And so it needed more testing. So again, the principle behind this is defining the formula, designing the formulation to get to more people and to work for more bodies. So that's what we did. So um, again, I was one of the co-leads of Tixagevimab, so Gavimab, which was then later branded as Evisheld, um, which got an EUA um, for prevention, and we were using it here for treatment. Um, what we showed was that the thigh muscle had rapid absorption, uh, thigh muscle administration, People, of course, had a higher exposure if they were lower in weight or lower in BMI. And we also did see that there was a higher variability in women than men, again, um, due to probably the adipose distribution um, in, in women and men in general. But compared to AstraZeneca's initial phase one study in which they looked at it in the glute, there was actually less person-to-person -person variability overall and more of a smooth absorption. Um, we also tested twice the dose that was tested in phase one because I knew that compared to a preventative study, we needed to get the drug into people's bodies quickly if we were using it for treatment because we already at that point knew that time to treatment, it was important for viral infections. So even though this product ended up not um, really working for treatment, um, the things that were actually, I think, really important about this is that when um, the FDA was looking at potentially um, deprecating uh, um, 
uh, Evisheld for prevention, they ended up being able to double the dose and keep efficacy for longer with new variants based on the fact that we had tested 600 milligrams in our study. Um, we found that it was safe and people tolerated this uh, volume well in the thigh. And then um, the ongoing studies that are being run by this, uh, this um, industry partner, as well as other um, companies are now looking at giving therapeutic um, monoclonal antibodies in the thigh um, at higher doses again, just because of the fact that this is um, uh, works better for more people and is probably easier to distribute. So again, the ongoing supernova study, we have it enrolling here at the Fred Hutch um, under uh, uh, my colleague, Jim Bunirana uh, Tana Kornkit. So um, what are some of the epidemic trial challenges we faced? Um, despite, again, this big international active effort, the regulatory burden of running these trials is extremely high to train, to start, to maintain. This hasn't changed at all since the pandemic. And this is something that is very difficult for us as investigators to control because it's the uh, environment, it's the clinical trials environment that we work in. Um, and there still hasn't really been a lot of change in the cooperation between public and private testing sites, referrals, um, public health. We sort of have these temporary changes during an epidemic, but really the system overall has not changed um, since 2020. And then we really need to think about how to coordinate off-label treatments, um, emergency use access to therapy with studies to make sure it's equitable, to make sure we're not precluding research and to make sure that the people who have access to the investigational therapies through EUA and through studies are not the same people, both also leaving out the people who really need to be getting it. Um, and, and really what we found is that we tried to conduct business as usual. Too many study procedures, too many requirements, 30 pages consents with lots of legalese, really lack of visibility and coordination amongst research studies, research and clinical care. And then again, this um, uh, kind of the standard is bringing people to the research. Um, my colleague, David Bulwer, wrote just a really poignant uh, commentary about some of these things um, yesterday, just yesterday in clinical infectious disease. So I invite you to read that. It was really kind of felt like my experience as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, now some of the things that we did that were innovative during the pandemic that I think really led us to be leaders across both the UW and the Fred Hutch. And I wanna emphasize that while, um, you know, I sit between both institutions and this building is physically at the Fred Hutch, um, it really is a collaborative effort. And we um, kind of streamlined through the ITHS working group, um, all outpatient um, clinical therapeutics trials through this space because it was a safe space to conduct it, it didn't overburden the clinical spaces at the U that that already didn't have enough um, staffing and space for us, and so it really kind of um, opened up the space and the ability to do this. And and again, despite being physically at the Hutch, has really been a, a collaborative um, a collaborative effort. So that's our building there. It's the um, old office building that they painted teal um, on the bottom for us. It was completely revamped to look like that picture on the top. That is actually our unit that they built out of an old office building um, with 11 negative pressure rooms, HEPA towers in each um, in each room, um, uh, layback and fusion chairs so we could do long studies, uh, a hot and a cold zone, um, donning and doffing capabilities. I mean, this was really up to much higher standards than we even think we need now for COVID, but it really allowed um, our staff, especially before um, vaccines, to feel comfortable working there for us to handle a very high volume and for us to see immunocompromised um, people with and without COVID in the same um, clinic site without putting anybody at risk. Um, we also piloted weekend coverage there using um, some rotating nursing pool staff and developed partnerships with um, city and county testing sites and worked closely with the COVID therapeutics team um, led by Shrisha Danaretti and um, Rupali Jain and others um, to make sure that our studies were in line with, with what was happening clinically and that people were being referred to research um, kind of in, as part of, of um, that pathway and getting referrals for our, from our immunocompromised services, both at the U and the Hutch. So um, some of the results of this is that to date, we've enrolled over 330 participants into interventional studies and contributed to the EUAs of um, several products. 
Um, these are all of our colleagues. Um, most of them are in, in AID um, and or the Hutch, um, but we've also conducted studies, um, for example, led by James Andrews um, for an infused ribonuclease for long COVID. Um, so that's a faculty member um, from rheumatology who's since moved to UAB. Um, but we're also looking at novel vaccine products with um, Dr. Josh Hill and monoclonals for prevention, as I mentioned with Dr. Jim Boone. And also um, as well, facilitating sick visits for other studies. So now I wanna talk a little bit about when we have fancy and research and clinical facilities, how do we actually make sure that we have um, everybody being able to access research? Um, because especially during an epidemic, research can be the standard of care. Um, research often is the standard of care and is part of an ethical way to distribute scarce, research, scarce resources during emergencies as acknowledged by the WHO um, and the National Academies. So I just wanted to highlight this is a really beautiful piece um, written by Janelle Stewart, um, another former um, member of AID who is now at the University of Minnesota and many, many of our colleagues here um, at the University of Washington that showed that um, decoupling the sort of usual in-person access to care from who gets to um, participate in studies really leads to um, improved rural urban access as well as racial and ethnic um, access um, to studies. And this is just a list of studies that people between the UW and the Hutch um, participated in that were either fully remote or partially remote um, and have really been part of changing the paradigm on how to conduct studies. So just another way that we broke some of the physical um, walls of studies um, was to use um, really creative team staffing and really creative ways to get to see um, patients in the hospital and to follow them afterwards. So this is the early days of the um, epidemic um, when um, UW medical students were not allowed to come to clinical uh, rotations. They formed the UW COVID-19 Student Service Corps and six really fantastic students signed up um, to work with us. Um, and what they really did is they worked in um, both Northwest and Montlake um, parts of UW Medical Center and Harborview and did teach-ins with the clinical nurses and essentially made it so that when we weren't as study teams allowed to go into patient rooms or do double blood draws, um, they were really helping lift the burden off of the clinical teams and help make sure that the, the research labs and swabs and, um, and IP were getting handled well. Um, and then we even did home visits after discharge from the hospital. This is something that the sponsor hadn't even thought about. And we pushed them to say um, that we um, were going to go visit people in their home while they were still in isolation and follow up on them, do blood draws, swabs, vital signs. And um, they originally asked us to put each location that we were going to see study participants in on our federal 1572 form or our form um, stating all of our research locations. And we asked them how to put somebody's fishing cooler in their garage on a 1572 form. And they just looked a little bit confused at us. But anyways, these are some of the locations that we conducted study visits at. Um, I wanted to talk more about fully remote studies, uh, another version, again, of bringing the study to the people. So um, there were a lot of changes in even um, federal uh, acceptance and university IRB and, um, and central IRB acceptance of using telephone um, and electronic consents. Um, we used a lot of different methods to courier or ship study supplies, including blinded medications that were um, stable at ambient temperatures. Um, we had per, um, participants collect their own data by red cap surveys. Oftentimes, you know, if we sent a pulse socks home with them or um, one of these little patchy KGs, which Christine Johnston study um, used, and I know many of our cardiologists is, um, use for clinical care and for their own research. Um, but we had people collect their own data, had them collect their own swabs. We're having people collect their own MPOC swabs as part of remote studies. Um, and then um, Michael Book and Alpana Wagmar and, and a number of other people are piloting um, these Tasso um, blood draw devices, which is like a little capillary leech device um, that uh, apparently fairly painlessly pulls blood off um, and keeps it stable so that it can be sent for PK testing, safety testing, um, and a number of other a number of other tests, including virologic tests. Um, one of, I think, the really big benefits of this and probably one of my favorite participant interactions during the pandemic um, was enrolling a person in a fully remote study um, in a state in the southeast um, who lived in a rural area. And we were getting the alarms going off on Red Cap telling us that this person's vital signs were looking um, concerning. Um, so I actually gave her a call and found out that she wasn't going to go to the emergency room because she was worried about what to do with um, her cat while she was gone. And so we helped her problem solve how to get her cat to a safe place so that she could get to care and get to the hospital before um, she uh, was too hypoxemic. 
So these are really ways in which, you know, we can even improve the clinical care of people who we've never met, who we've never seen, um, who are distant from us. And I think that that is, you know, again, whether or not the study product works um, is a really important part about, about doing remote research. So I want to pivot a little bit away from um, uh, the kind of COVID experience for the most part and talk about our new, uh, new old clinical research center. Um, so UW Positive Research. Um, on the left is a picture of Dr. Ann Collier, um, one of my mentors who founded, uh, co-founded um, uh, the AIDS Clinical Trials Unit in 1987. And this is her giving a speech at our outdoor um, uh, kind of celebration in honor of our renaming and her retirement. Um, and um, and this was in was last year. And then a picture of um, myself and our one of our staff members and our community members tabling at Pride on Capitol Hill um, last year. So I mentioned that ACTU um, has been at Harborview. Well, it's actually first in um, on Madison Street where the Whole Foods is um, in 1987, um, and and then moved. Um, to the building in two West Clinic in Harborview in 1996 when that building was moved. It's a part of the, um, the National AIDS Clinical Trials Group, which is an NIAID network site. And then it joined up with what's called the Seattle CTU or the Seattle Clinical Trials Unit um, uh, run by Julie McElrath at the Fred Hutch and um, her HVTN site called the Seattle Vaccine Trials Unit, which is um, sort of UW Fred Hutch collaboration and Cabrini Tower um, on First Hill. Um, I took over as director um, from Dr. Collier in September of 2020, not at all a hectic time, having also just um, stepped into the medical directorship of the COVID Clinical Research Center a month before. Um, and then as things settled down a little bit, we worked on a renaming process with our community in 2021, just thinking about really how to refresh our image. Um, most people who are living with HIV don't identify as having AIDS, um, never will have AIDS. And many of the people that we have in our studies also um, don't have um, HIV at all, are preventing HIV or treating a co-infection like hepatitis, like MPOX, like, um, uh, like COVID or substance abuse disorder. And so we really wanted to both modernize, destigmatize, and welcome people into this new vision. Um, and so, again, we held that celebration last year. Um, and I think, you know, it's been in the works for a while, but partially in inspired by what we've been working on, as well as, um, you know, inspiring other sites doing this work. Um, our network actually just renamed themselves Advancing Clinical Therapeutics Globally for HIV, AIDS, and Related Infections. And they're launching um, the new logo, which I've just seen, and it will become public on December 1st. So I think, you know, we're trying to move again into the future, acknowledging that we're in a different phase from when um, these, uh, these networks and these research centers were founded, and that we still really need um, to find treatments and, and HIV remission strategies for people with HIV, but we're in a different era and we um, also need to be more inclusive. So um, I've talked a little bit about, um, you know, a lot of our past already. Um, we're currently building a focus on long acting injectable antiretroviral therapy. I don't want to talk um, about it um, too much other than the projects that we're specifically working on, because I know that Dr. Susan Graham will be talking um, at Grand Rounds about this topic in just a few weeks. Um, but we also focus on HIV remission studies. And then we've really been working on being more of a shared resource model for studies that are appropriate um, to uh, kind of the two West Clinic populations, so ID Clinic, um, Madison Clinic, um, and so we've developed a stronger partnership with um, the UW CIFAR and their observational studies. Um, recently, we had the chance to par partner with Dr. Judith Sui from General Internal Medicine in her NIDA-funded um, study looking at long-acting buprenorphine for people with meth abuse with or without HIV, um, but, but because it had the similar population and um, required space and staff, um, we did a collaborative um, effort with them in our space. Um, uh, Dr. Connie Kellum's DOXYPEP study, um, which has just um, recently helped change guidelines, um, was also in our space. And this was less of a collaboration in terms of staffing, but again, um, wanting to just create a space um, and, um, and resources were needed to make sure that we're all working together. And so um, for any of you who are doing this kind of work and, and want to partner, we would love to talk more um, with you about it. So now I want to dive a little bit into the long-acting injectable antiretroviral therapy that we are working on specifically. 
So why long acting antiretroviral therapy? Again, um, I know Dr. Susan Graham's going to talk a little bit more about this, but in order to reach the 25, 20, uh, the 2025 UN targets, which unfortunately I don't think we'll be reaching other than in a few places like Botswana and in King County here, um, we are trying to have everybody globally um, know that they're diagnosed with HIV. 95% um, of those start treatment and 95% of those have a suppressed viral load. Um, just for reference, 66% of people with HIV in the US have a suppressed viral load. We're actually doing much worse than a lot of countries um, that have lower resources than we do. But overall, as we know, a lot of our, um, our health metrics uh, lag other countries as well. Um, so thinking about this sort of inverse care law that states that the people that most are most at need are often um, the ones who are underserved by care. This, again, is also, um, I think, synonymous um, in this um, in this vein with uh, pharmacoequity and knowing that there are disparities in and among people with HIV that have a lot of barriers to care. Um, we know that long acting ART can address many of the needs of a diverse group of people with HIV um, who currently need lifelong treatment and currently are, are not really being well served or a lot of people are not currently being well served by one pill once a day. So what is our current um, long acting um, ART? So the only FDA and, um, and um, European approvals for long acting ART is combination of cabotegravir and ropivirine. There is another drug called lenacapavir that's approved, but it's not its own full regimen and it's only for people with um, significant resistance. So um, this cabropivirine combination is the first, it's the only right now. Um, it's not inferior to oral drug, but it's only indicated for people who have viral suppression. Um, there are very high levels of satisfaction uh, with this, both in the research and the real world, but it also has a lot of barriers to use. So as we know here, as we've been implementing it here in King County, again, one of the best resourced places in the country, um, the cost of the drug is high. Um, it is the cost of the drug is reimbursed um, in some ways, but not necessarily the medical staff and some of the pharmacy dispensing to provide it um, through, through insurance and federal funding. It requires cold chain. It requires um, pharmacy staff to do all the injections or nursing staff. Um, and it also requires somebody like a program manager to track um, who's getting injections and when they need to come in and to, to call them when they don't. Um, and, and also globally, one of the big barriers is that more than 10% of people have um, pretreatment resistance to one of the two drugs in that combination. So it shouldn't be used without a genotype um, or without someone having been suppressed on, on a similar um, drug in the family. And among people who've had um, treatment experience or treatment failure, that rate of pretreatment resistance to ropivirine can go up as high as 80%. Um, so there are a lot of limitations in its use. So thinking again about long-acting ART and pharmacoequity, um, traditionally, the results of uh, drug and diagnostics research are very slow to reach low and middle income countries, um, but we really have the ability to narrow the gap uh, with this version of what we're working on. And I just love this quote, but this is our first um, research participant who volunteered to be in a news story about being the very first human to ever receive this new drug that we're working on at UW um, that I'll talk a little bit about. So how do we make um, this drug go global? So the WHO recommends a drug combination as a single tablet regimen called um, TLD um, as first line. There's almost 8 million people globally who are accessing T TLD and our best numbers are actually pre-pandemic. Um, and in people with virologic failure, um, uh, as I mentioned, it's it's difficult to use um, the cabropivirine combination because of the resistance to it. Um, and there's also no ex existing combination that's a long acting combination for a whole regimen in a single injection. And um, globally, most of the supply of TLD and any antiretroviral therapies are coming through generic supply manufactured in low and middle income countries um, funded by PEPFAR or bought um, by government um, ministries of health. And so we really need a different way to get drug to people. So this is where UW comes in um, with the TLC ART project and GLAD. So Dr. Rod, um, Rodney Ho, who's in the pharmacology um, group in the Department of, um, of Pharmacy here at the UW, um, and his team have developed over many, many years um, a product that is called targeted long-acting combination therapy using a molecule um, that is tightly has tightly bound antiretrovirals um, in it. It uses two li uh, lipid excipients. So essentially, these are the um, kind of same types of um, lipid that they put in emulsions for a lot of the drugs that we use um, clinically, like 
ambisome, like chemotherapy, and even mRNA vaccines. And what it does is it creates a nanoparticle um, that's very different from a, um, a depo version of a long-acting drug and can have multiple drugs bound to it. Um, this program was led um, clinically by um, Dr. Ann Collier, and I took over the, uh, the clinical leadership of, of this program um, together with uh, my partner, Dr. Ho, um, earlier this year. So this program was started in 2015. Um, this is just showing the long path to development of a clinical product. Um, so it was tested in, um, in rats, in beagles, in non-human primates, um, all the way up. And there's many different products in the pipeline, including this first product called 101, a TLD product, um, and a tenofovir alone product that is um, being looked at for potentially a, a long-acting treatment for people with chronic hepatitis B. So this is our TLC ART-101 drug actually in the flesh. That's actually the vial that Andy Kim, who is in that picture, got um, just a few minutes later. Um, again, it's this drug combination nanoparticle that has on it um, or in it lopinavir, ritonavir, and tenofovir. Um, we don't really consider this a fully active antiretroviral therapy regimen with two active drugs. Rip uh, ritonavir here is just really a booster, um, but it's really been used as... Um, for a, a, a complicated number of reasons, this was the initial um, drug chosen to test as a proof of concept of this molecule for safety and for long acting use. Um, again, it's not a, a depot drug. The drugs were released slowly in the lymphatics after a subcutaneous injection. Um, and we started an adaptive first in human protocol um, and which will essentially enroll a total of 12 to 16 participants with increases and decreases in the dose level, depending on what we need for um, pharmacokinetics and safety. So how are we doing with this? We have enrolled and completed our first four participants, which is our first cohort. There were no safety concerns. Um, three out of four people had a grade one injection site reaction, which is essentially what we expect with pretty much any injected um, substance, um, cabropivirine or vaccines, for example. So we consider that to be a success. Um, we are just on the, the eve of our data safety meeting that will look at our pharmacokinetics and determine whether our next go dose goes up or down or stays the same. Um, and will also pave the way for the long-acting TLD version that's in preclinical development and in the process of looking at um, IND proposal to the FDA. So how do we expedite clinical development? I showed that um, uh, kind of timeline of how long it takes. Um, it, oftentimes it takes even longer to do um, standard single phase trials because the turnaround is slow. So this is where these adaptive protocols um, and platform trials um, that we were doing in COVID are also important. Um, this study, I think importantly, is being powered by UnitAid and the medicine patents pool, so which are um, sort of adjacent to the WHO and making sure this, that this will be developed as a global generic. Um, so it will go first to the people who need it, if it works, of course. Um, and um, we're looking at developing a um, a multi-phase trial following the initial safety studies and doing that in a setting um, in which uh, it's a high prevalence uh, area with strong gen uh, generic ART manufacturing. So for example, in India, um, where uh, the generic oral version of this drug is already made and we have clinical partners and clinical trialists who are looking at this. Um, a lot of the work has also been um, led by Ann Melvin for the pediatric development of this drug um, and Dr. Kristin um, Bayama sophie from the Department of Global Health, who's really making sure that the feasibility, the acceptability, and implementation of this um, are spot on with the populations who need it. So pivoting to um, a little bit of a, of a different um, question to be answered by long-acting injectables, I did just talk a little bit about the limitations of um, long-acting injectable cabropivirine. Um, and and that it, in the United States are really at the FDA approvals for people with virologic suppression. And so as we know, the people who need it most are the people who are not able to take their daily antiretroviral therapy. And so um, my colleague Monica Gandhi at UCSF um, started a pilot um, of giving uh, more than 100 people um, uh, cabropivirine injections without virologic suppression and showing that um, it was very much uh, a success with only two people developing virologic resistance. And both of those people are people who had never taken um, oral pills in their life and said that they wouldn't go on to take oral pills. And so the fact that they were um, suppressed for a time was, was potentially the only su suppressed that they've um, 
they've had in their life. So I think this is really good news, but this is not enough to change practice because there's obviously a lot of concern about developing resistance and the difficulties of implementing this um, in a population that has barriers to care. So what are we doing? Um, so I am um, leading a um, pragmatic clinical trial that will be both efficacy um, and um, looking at the implementation. This is a really unique partnership trial. So the study design was proposed by myself and Monica Gandhi and Adia Rana, who just came to the UW um, to speak two weeks ago from UAB. Um, but so we proposed it um, to Vive um, the and GSK, the manufacturer of um, long-acting cab ropivirine. And the study is in planning stage, but um, Vive and GSK offered to sponsor this study. Um, but I will be leading the study as sort of like an external PI, and it will be in collaboration with the ACTG um, and open to non-NIH sites, but sort of preference to non-NIH sites. And, and the idea is to use um, an external control from, um, from an already ongoing ACTG study with um, with a similar a similar population um, uh, to, help, um, to help with the study design. But again, we're looking primarily for people or exclusively for people who are unsuppressed despite being previously prescribed antiretroviral therapy who have demonstrated barriers to care, um, who often belong to marginalized populations. And we really want to expand this drug access to people with unsuppressed HIV. So in order to do that, we also need to add implementation science. And often implementation of a product is, is studied after it's already been developed. So we wanna do this at the same time. This is an FDA approved product, but for this new indication, um, and so we want to look at the fidelity to the intervention. So how many people receive their injections and receive them on time and window, um, looking at patient-based outcomes. So how do people uh, report the acceptability and barriers and difficulty getting into clinic? What would it make, what would make it easier for them to get into clinic? Um, and then looking at the feasibility and burden on the clinical and research staff. And so this is something that we've talked extensively about um, with our colleagues at um, the Sexual uh, Health Clinic and, and the Max Clinic um, at, at Seattle King County and, and um, Harborview and at the Madison Clinic with our low barrier clinics, just about how much effort um, and how much infrastructure it takes to give this drug to people who are already suppressed and what it would take for us to be able to do that um, for people who need extra help um, being maintained on study. And so we're trying to build in um, some of these aspects into the trial to be able to measure it, quantify it, and make sure that when, um, if and when it works for this population, it also works to give to this population. So this is not really a true kind of hybrid effectiveness IS trial because it's being conducted in a, in a research clinic as opposed to the quote real world, um, but it's a little bit of a hybrid between um, a research study and a real world study, even though we're looking at, at efficacy. So how do we move our clinical trials into the future? I think the fundamental part of this that has not changed since I've begun this journey is that we still exist inside a system that needs urgent change. And so one of the things I've been trying to do is um, talk to anybody who will listen to me and uh, together with my colleagues about um, trying to rethink clinical trials overall. So my colleagues, David Boulouard, um, who have been really um, invested in remote and accessible um, COVID clinical trials, um, and BK Tatanji at Emory, who's uh, an MPOX expert, um, have really been talking about how do we change the system? And it's not changing academic research centers alone, it's changing um, public health, it's changing the FDA, it's changing our regulatory um, uh, pathways nationally and internationally. And um, and I think this, is, this story is getting a lot of attention, including um, JAMA, the journal held their first ever summit um, and invited um, a number of us to come and talk about the question, is the clinical trials enterprise broken and how can we fix it? So stay tuned for the, the proceedings from this meeting that hopefully um, myself and colleagues will be able to, to put on the pages of JAMA. So what we have published overall is what we call sort of a clinical trial pandemic playbook. Um, I know that the National Academy of Medicine is also working on along a similar effort. Um, because the stakeholders in this, again, are not just the clinical trialists. So these are some ideas that we put forth of what needs to change and who are the stakeholders in this. The hospital systems, uh, including UW Medicine, um, are part of the stakeholders, but it's not, it's, we're not, we're not the only ones who can change the system. This involves public health, as we mentioned. It involves coordinating um, research and distribution of um, investigational product access under EUAs or INDs. It means that we change how we offer research alongside clinical care um, during times of scarcity. Um, and it means that we need to lighten the regulatory constraints. So why are we consenting people to 31 pages of legalese eight times during a trial? 
Um, can we do a three page consent like the recovery trial did in the UK? Can our staff just be rapidly trained in the clinical setting to be able to ethically um, uh, consent people to research that in a way that doesn't burden them? Right now, it's not possible because the onus of research is so um, difficult is so heavy that a clinician who has a busy schedule um, and isn't previously trained in research really can't do this on the fly. So that needs to change. Um, and we also need to lighten and incentivize clinical trial implementation. So remote contactless trials, some of the things that I was talking about. Um, we love collecting um, peripheral blood mononuclear nuclear cells, collecting sort of all of the things possible, having all the regulatory possible, but we really need to think about how to do this in a lighter and faster way and when we really need the additional samples and, when we, and data and when we really just need um, to get it done and get the results out. Um, and we also need to keep funding our clinical trial infrastructure so that the next time this happens, because it will, we're not rebuilding every single time um, because we really aren't funded in a way to keep this infrastructure running between, between epidemics. So what can we do here um, at the UW and the Fred Hutch? So again, our focus has really been on designing studies on, with access in mind, um, remote and hybrid studies, um, bringing people to research, um, so either door to door service to us or bringing ourselves to them. Um, can we conduct some more of our research, for example, in the UW neighborhood clinics? Can we do home visits? How can we reduce the procedures and the burden to the participants? Um, how can we make this less scary to people who already might be skeptical or have really founded um, concerns about participating in, in medicine and science based off of intergenerational trauma? How do we broaden eligibility, eligibility criteria so real people can enter these studies so that our results are interpretable? interpretable? Um, one thing that you know has really been um, difficult is all of the numbers of institutional review boards. And now with single IRB, which is supposed to make everything easier, it just means that we're submitting everything in duplicate. Um, how can a federally qualified health center or a public health department actually do the regulatory burden to keep this, um, this going? They can't. So it means that those centers can't um, en enroll vulnerable participants unless we change the system. Um, we also need to strengthen our partnerships for research. So um, working with diverse partners to build trust and engagement. I, I don't want to sort of name our partners because this is not, uh, in my mind, show and tell about, uh, about this. But um, we really need to sort of work. And what we have been doing is working on deepening some of those interactions um, created um, during COVID and really make meaningful and long-lasting relationships with some of these communities with um, providers outside of the UW system, and then also making it easier for our trainees and for our clinical teams um, to join into research, um, to become clinical researchers themselves, or to learn about it, to dabble in it, um, and, and to support that. Um, so more on integrating research into clinical care. I'm really excited about the opportunity to get um, to kind of revamp our process with Madison Clinic leadership, with sexual health clinic, um, and with our low barrier clinics to really think about how we can make our um, what we call a teaching environment, a learning environment, as we think about for our learners, meaning our medical trainees, how we can also be learning from our patients, by our patients at the same time and moving their care forward at the same time as we're moving science forward. And, um, and I think this is really exciting. And I'm, I'm personally really excited about kind of rededicating ourselves to that. Um, I wanted to call it a couple of programs that are already doing this very well. So the CF program here at UW, um, Hutch Leukemia and Lymphoma Clinics, I think many others, but there are some programs in which every single patient who walks into the door for clinical care is also offered research um, and offered research based off of um, what would also uh, move their clinical care forward. Um, and, and I think CIFAR, the Centers for AIDS Research, has come up with a really brilliant campaign, which is just reminding patients how the basics of what we know about their care come from research. So how do we know that CD4 counts are important? How do we know that the viral load is a good surrogate marker for antiretroviral therapy success? This all came from research. How are people taking one pill once a day as opposed to handfuls and handfuls of pills? This is research. So um, we even in the era in which HIV treatment is um, quote unquote, easy for a lot of people. Again, we really need to, to remind people that they can still contribute to making other people's lives easier and reducing the comorbidities of HIV and other diseases that way. Um, there are also a lot of great new tools being built into clinical care um, through EPIC that can help us find potentially eligible research participants across the U. I know that um, uh, Dr. Wald and Dr. Johnston's um, 
uh, virology research clinic is already doing that. We're already doing this. And I think a lot of clinics are doing this as well. And then research can also in turn provide benefit to the providers by putting our entering our research labs and our research notes back into Epic so that it's helping move people's clinical care forward and not um, kind of blinding um, our providers to what is going on with our participants and their patients. So I also want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the Hutch to become a hub for infectious disease pathogenesis and clinical trials. So we're talking about version 2.0 of the COVID Clinical Research Center and how we can morph COVID-19 research into, this is, this is not a formal new name, but kind of uh, a, a concept or idea of a name that we've been, been spitballing is sort of a center for innovation, center for clinical innovation and discovery that would focus on ID and immunology and immunocompromised folks. So we've built up this huge resource. The resource is not just the building, it's central staffing with regulatory support, contracting support, um, clinical support and, and um, SOPs that mean that we can, we know how to move product from the research pharmacy and samples and, and everything like that. And, and looking to see whether we can use our high infection prevention standards to keep seeing immunocompromised folks with, vir with respiratory viruses. Can we look at some of the BCG and malaria studies that are being done through the HIV vaccine trials network and malaria trials network um, and have a home for those there? Um, can we help with sick visits for, for example, um, uh, our colleague Guan Ching Cheng in pulmonology is doing um, a study with spirometry, but because of airborne precautions, it's difficult to be able to do spirometry during sick visits um, uh, in the hutch. And so, um, we're helping facilitate those as well. So these are ways that we're thinking about, you know, as COVID studies keep going on, but into the future that we can really, um, keep moving, uh, research forward. So, um, again, we have lots of, lots of resources that we've built up and a lot of collaboration. Um, we've worked with people who are not um, part of it, who are not in allergy and infectious disease, and we have this model for collaboration. We've been collaborating across both institutions during the whole um, epidemic. And so, um, so I think that this is something that we would like to continue into the future, regardless of what happens with COVID. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our new directions with UW Positive Research back on the Harborview side. Um, so we have some really uh, exciting studies in the pipeline. Um, looking at a dual combo, it's actually a monoclonal antibody as well as, a, as an siRNA. I, I missed the siRNA on the slide um, for hepatitis B uh, with or without HIV. So this is a novel hepatitis cure strategy. This is coming through the ACTG, but I'm very excited that um, my colleague Maria Corcoran um, is going to be um, leading this study locally. Um, and then we're looking at multiple therapeutic vaccine studies for people with HIV. We're looking at um, the safety and pharmacokinetics of estrogen for trans femme folks with HIV on different antiretroviral therapy strategies. And then we're also doing a lot more synergy with the Seattle Vaccine Trials Unit um, and trying to move our research as opposed to like positive and negative research or prevention and treatment into more sort of a status neutral space, which is how we're providing HIV care these days and assisting each other with recruitment. And again, looking at populations that are, would be engaged in treatment and prevention and having broader communities, um, stakeholder engagement. Um, so that is something that um, I'm really excited about as well. So please come innovate with us. Um, I really want to extend this in, uh, invitation to, you know, senior fellows to establish clinicians. Come join us as investigators if you have an idea, if you want to get your feet wet with clinical trials. Um, I think that this kind of collaborative clinical research um, uh, idea is is something that we can help um, help facilitate even more than we already are. I'm a clinician, of course, as well as a researcher, so um, this is near and dear to me. And again, we're kind of limiting the scope of our research to um, people who are focused on this population, again, because um, there are other research centers throughout the university, including and at Harborview, and one that's building at Harborview as well for non-infectious disease research. So um, kind of staying within this topic, um, we're really open to ideas and, and sharing resources in this constrained environment. So um, I just wanted to show off, this is our team across um, both um, UW Positive Research and the Vaccine Trials Unit. We received a UW Medicine Wellbeing Grant. We worked with Dance Church and we had a really sweaty, fun time and then sat down for some meaningful discussion about how to work um, better together in the future and, and kind of go forward with community engagement after the pandemic. Um, and I just want to give a, a small plug to um, mentees who I didn't get to talk about um, their work in this because they mainly are working on HIV and cancer or other clinical trials. 
So if you need somebody to come speak on any of these topics, um, these four women are rock stars, and I encourage you to reach out to, to them or to me if I can help connect you um, to these great researchers. And I wanted to just end with gratitude as well. So gratitude to all of the teams that I work with, to my many mentors, of course, to my mentees for teaching me things um, and um, to the partnerships with um, many colleagues and, and the clinical services. And of course, to the Fialco family and the Department of Medicine for the honor of this award. And lastly, I wanna thank my family for being flexible and silly during the past couple of years. And of course, to um, my parents, Dr. Phil and Bernadine Bender, who both have been clinical faculty out in Whammy Land um, for the last um, several decades and retired recently. And lastly, it is my mother's birthday. And so I wanted to wish you a very personalized happy birthday um, as a former member of the Department of Medicine as well. So thank you so much. Uh, th th thank you, uh, Rachel, and congratulations, Dr. Uh, Bender Ignacio, on being the 2023 Fialco Award uh, recipient. And it, uh, it, um, yeah, 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 I think your dad said, take a deep breath, he says <laughs> in the chat. So uh, anyway, uh, congratulations. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm not sure that we'll have any time for questions, but um, uh, I'm sure people can just, if you have a, a burning question, email. Um, uh, Dr. Bender Ignacio directly, and I'm sure she will respond. But thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Rachel. Nice presentation. Doing a lot of um, translational work there. Thank you so much.